what is going on everybody out there this is jake james lugo welcome to the channel and welcome to this brand new episode of jj's one man podcast it is about that time people the season finale to obi-wan kenobi on disney plus the episode six premiere late last night i was up along with everybody else i was part of a watch party uh checking out the episode as it went live on disney plus and man do we have a lot to talk about? There is a lot to unpack with this episode, not just because it's the season finale, but we got to see a lot of things finally, hopefully, quote unquote, come together, right? So there is going to be spoilers in this episode here, which again, many of you right now at this point, if you've been following this entire series that I've been posting up on the channel a little bit earlier for Patreon and such, uh, you already know that we do spoilers here with this stuff. So episode six of Kenobi, man, ugh. Where do I even begin? Because there's a lot, right? So the episode begins just as the, you know, the fallout of the previous episode of episode five, uh, Obi-Wan and the resistance or the little resistance cell is on the run. They're trying to get away from Vader and the Imperial uh, fleet per people that are there, the Star Destroyer. Uh, Reva is on her way to Tatooine and the episode opens up with Reva already on Tatooine. I will say that you know, looking back at the previous five episodes up till now, this show has a weird thing with time because technically Reva does not take that long to get to Tatooine. Like she, in the previous episode, she's still lying on the ground, like after just being stabbed by Darth Vader. And now like literally if you were just binging the series, she's on Tatooine and the people over that are running from the Imperials are still in space, like over the planet. It's like, what the heck just happened? Did she teleport? Like, I know it's a small nitpick, but it's just something that I notice from throughout this entire show. Now, anyway, Reva is on Tatooine. She's looking for the Lars homestead, and she knows that there's something over there. She knows about Luke Skywalker. I don't think she knows about the boy, per se, Luke Skywalker, until at least until she gets over there. But she knows that she has to go to Tatooine and go to the Lars farm. Uh, so with that... Uh, Lars has to, Lars and Aunt Peru, by the way, I have to say, uh, they have to prepare for Reva's arrival. Um, she pretty, pretty much Owen gets word that, uh, somebody is looking for him and it's Reva, one of the inquisitors. Uh, he finds out from another person that literally was telling Reva where they, these people are and he gets her, him and Aunt Peru get ready for battle. Basically they put Luke inside like the, one of the little sheds or one of the little like, you know, compartments there. Uh, so that way he could be away. I'll tell you right now, they really get close to like skirting the line of like breaking cannon. Like they come right up to the line. It's a very thin line and they are literally right there. They're just not stepping over it. They, they come in damn close to this thing. But they get ready for battle, basically. So as this is going on, okay, I should actually, because I'm jumping all over the place, uh, Obi-Wan and Roken and Leia kind of argue a little bit because Obi-Wan wants to be used as a distraction to get a get Vader away from the running uh, survivors from the planet. Uh, they're going to go to some random planet. I don't remember the specific planet they were saying. I'm pretty sure it's related to canon in some way. But... Um, Obi-Wan gets into a small little argument. He, you know, he has a little moment with Leia. He has a little moment with Roken. By the way, Roken, I don't, I don't know what it is. Like O'Shea Jackson really bigged up his part as part of this series. And he really doesn't do much. I'm going to be honest with you. Like, I don't mind him being there. I wish he was like actually more relevant as far as being something more significant in the conflict of everything going on. But he really doesn't do much. Like he's just the head of the resistance cell that's there. You know, or the rebel, the pre proto rebel alliance, I should say, but the path is really what the name is. And he's just kind of there. He doesn't really do much because after this one little encounter, this one little exchange, he disappears for the rest of the show, which is we'll get to that in a second. Okay. Because there's some other people that disappear from this show at this point. And, you know, Obi Wan, you know, he gets ready, he uses his lightsaber, he try, tries to communicate with Qui Gon again saying that, listen, like, you know, this stuff is going down. One of us is dying. If I have to kill him, it's going to be, you know, it's going to go down. And he takes a shuttle pod or an escape pod and actually directs it to go back to the planet that they were just on. And uh, Vader and the Grand Inquisitor see this. They're in the Star Destroyer. They're firing on the, the shuttle. And Vader's like, you know what? Let's pursue him. And the Grand Inquisitor is like, listen, like, we don't need to just go after him. We have the resistance cell there. We could just go get him right now. And Vader's like, no, he's the priority because he's not just any Jedi, which I get. I understand Vader would be super upset. I wish that same type of energy was throughout the entire series. That should be really the 
the mindset of Vader throughout the entire series, throughout all the episodes that we see him, because this felt more in line where Vader would be so blinded by his rage to go after Obi-Wan that he would just completely ignore all these other people because he has a better prize in killing or finding and capturing Obi-Wan Kenobi. That just makes more sense to me. So this gets the big setup for the big final showdown, the quote unquote rematch of the century that we were promised throughout this entire series. We didn't really get it the first time that we saw Vader in episode three, which made sense narratively because that's the first time technically that Obi-Wan Kenobi sees Vader, which we've talked about in the past in previous podcast episodes. And I've seen other people discuss this as well, that basically it just feels a little weird that Obi-Wan Kenobi has not seen Darth Vader in like a hollow projection or holographic network or any sort of mention of him throughout the last 10 years since revenge of the sith but i digress we moved on from there so this gets the big setup for this showdown right and they go down to the planet or at least obi-wan goes down to the planet he gets ready he actually has lola the little uh droid that leia had at, at one point and leia gives it to him before he heads over there and he leaves it on the ship i don't know why it's there maybe it's just like a sentimental reminder to come back but i digress again so while this is all going on, okay, we keep cutting in between what's going on with Obi-Wan Kenobi and Vader and what's going on with Owen and uh, Reva, or at least Owen, Amperu, and uh, Reva. Now, a lot of people, myself included, weren't too much of a fan of this, of like the inner cutting like this. I would have rather had it where we got the Reva stuff towards the very end, which I think was maybe possibly the plan for this show when they were making it. But just the, again, the thing with the time frame, the just the passage of time, is just very weird here. Older Star Wars media like the movies and some of the other shows like Clone Wars and Rebels have dealt with this much better, in my personal opinion. I felt like whoever was editing this or whoever was like looking over the show, maybe Deborah Chow, I don't know who, uh, wasn't really kind of, you know, getting a good grasp on the way that time passes in the show. Uh, but we cut back over to Owen. We cut back over to Reva. And basically, Reva arrives on the farm late at night. She's ready to start, like, you know, just causing havoc. She has her lightsaber. Again, they're going real close to the line when it comes to crossing and breaking cannon. But they don't. Uh, while Luke is hidden away in another compartment, uh, Amperu and Uncle Owen get their blasters. They get ready. Like, Amperu all of a sudden became a commando in this episode. I don't know. When did Amperu become such, like, a freedom fighter? Which kind of makes sense a tiny, tiny bit. Like, I'll give you some leeway with that because they are on the farm in Tatooine. They got to fight against the sand people. I don't think that Amperu is just going to be completely like useless, but it, it was just weird to see that because we never seen that before. Uh, but they get ready. They, they position up. Reva comes in. She tries to like stalk and like sneak her way into the actual farm and uh, they, a firefight breaks out and Aunt Brew and Uncle Owen start firing on Reva. She pulls out a lightsaber and a battle and a skirmish ensues. While this is going on, we finally get that start of that fight of the Battle of the Century. Obi-Wan Kenobi versus Darth Vader. The fight is pretty darn good. Right up to the fight start, we get some interesting dialogue uh, where Obi-Wan Kenobi pretty much says, like, I'll do what I must. He takes his uh, Sarisu, um, yeah, I think, yeah, it's a Sarisu stance from Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith, which looked really cool with older Obi-Wan Kenobi here. I think that everybody that was a prequel fan really appreciated that. It looked dope, you know, for that little moment. And then when the fight gets really started, this is a much more aggressive fight than the previous one. Uh, Obi-Wan is actually showing up to fight and Darth Vader is being a little bit more vicious. Now, as far as the different moments in this fight goes, because this fight had its great moments and it had some meh moments. The great moments included the uses of the Force, some of the flipping going around that we saw against Darth Vader and Reva, and Darth Vader's using the Force to kind of like block Obi-Wan Kenobi's lightsaber, which I appreciated. It was consistent with what the show has showed us up to that point, and it looked cool. Now, some of the other man moments was that some of the CGI and some of the effects during like some of the bigger moments here when Obi-Wan Kenobi's throwing rocks at Vader or when uh, was it Vader's throwing rocks at Obi-Wan Kenobi, they kind of like flip it doing both ways here. Uh, the CGI looked a little weird. It just didn't look right. It didn't look like it needed. Uh, it didn't look like it was actually like positioned or rendered in a way that made it look believable. Like it fit within the scene. Maybe it was the lighting. Maybe it was the fact that the way that the rocks moved in a specific way. But whatever it was, I could tell immediately it just looked a little hokey. So besides that, the fight continues going on, right? We cut back to Reva, Uncle Owen, and Amperu, which is what a lot of people, myself included, did not like because we have this awesome sequence going on over here and we have this kind of like really man mediocre sequence going on over here. Here's the problem that I feel like is going on with Reva, right? And I've been open about my, my thoughts, my criticism of Reva as a character is just 
It's just that she's been shown up to this point to not be very likable. She's just been shown to be very kind of mediocre in comparison to everybody else because even though she does have a redemption arc, she does have an arc where she has some sort of significance to the plot. It's such like overly emphasized and almost obnoxious to this point. You know, technically, she should be bodying Uncle Owen and Aunt Beru at this point because she has the force. She doesn't really use it as much. She uses it very sparingly. Granted, she was stabbed in the previous episode. But I mean, if we're going to believe that she's uh, tough enough to survive a stab like that and be able to make it to Tatooine in the short time frame that she did, it still feels like she should be able to body Uncle Owen like really quickly here. But we see a little bit of a struggle. She's blocking lightsaber fire. Uh, she's like, you know, tossing uh, Uncle Owen around and getting into a scuffle with Aunt Peru stuff. And eventually Luke ends up running out of the compartment that he's in and starts going off into the desert. Aunt Peru tells him to start running and Reva gets in for pursuit. This is when myself and everybody else was really worried because it's like, oh, if she pulls out this lightsaber, when this kid is looking at her, I'm going to flip over. Here. I'm going to flip a table, right? So then we finally cut back to the fight between Darth Vader and Obi-Wan Kenobi. Gets a little bit better with some of the fights, you know, some of the slashes and stuff. It looks good. Funny enough, no John Williams music, which we'll get to a little bit later because it actually does have John Williams music towards the end. But it would have been awesome to hear like a short rendition of maybe Battle of the Heroes or maybe Duel of Fates, which was the tracks that they used to promote this show in the trailers, which I do not understand why they are so like tiptoeing so cautious and overly suspect of using the classic star wars music that's what everybody has been saying th throughout this entire show for five episodes already that they haven't used this music and they have these moments like this that would have been perfect it would have made so much sense regardless though let me take a sip of this coffee because i'm like over here i'm hyped talking about this right which is a good thing for probably the wrong reason <laughs> but anyway i digress the fight continues Obi-Wan Kenobi and Darth Vader are fighting it out. Lightsaber combat looks dope. Uh, Darth Vader knocks Obi-Wan Kenobi down like this little kind of like, you know, I guess that this little recess where a bunch of like rocks and stuff fall down, right? On top of him. And by the way, Darth Vader finally has the high ground. He has the reverse high ground. He finally got his high ground uh, one up on Obi-Wan Kenobi. And then there's this little moment, it's almost like a Spider-Man moment, where we eventually see Obi-Wan Kenobi like under these rocks using the force to hold them up. And he has like these flashes in his mind, you know, flashing back to Leia. They really, really emphasize like his care for Leia, which I get, but it almost feels like it's kind of misplaced with this show. Like they made him spend a lot of time with Leia, but like no care about Luke. Like very briefly, we get this little flash of Luke with him even though his mission by yoda was to protect luke skywalker and tatooine like that's something he should probably have a little bit more care about you know what i'm saying because ever since he realized that maybe reva uh what is it possibly knows where uh luke skywalker is at or what that she's going to tatooine we haven't really seen him throughout this episode in the fallout of episode five you know worried about that and it's like very briefly touched on here and even in this moment so after like thinking about leia a little bit more and her smile he takes out all of the like different rocks and then goes back after Darth Vader. They have a little bit more of a scuffle. He gets one up on Darth Vader. He uses this really like, you know, big use of the force to pick up a bunch of rocks and just throw it at Vader. And it gets to a point that after a few more slashes, he knocks off Vader's helmet, which we all knew was going to happen at some point. It's a pretty much a clear nod to what happened in Rebels with Ahsoka and Darth Vader. It almost is like almost the exact same type of thing, but we get to see more of Hayden's face. And what I like here, what made this work a little bit better than most, was that we got to hear Hayden's voice meshed up a little bit with, uh, what is it? Um, uh, oh my God. Uh, what is it? James Earl Jones' voice. Almost Again, I'm so like all over the place with this show. I'm forgetting like basic things. But they mesh up Hayden's voice, Hayden Christensen's voice, with Darth Vader's voice, James Earl Jones' voice. And it's like they kind of switch between the two. And during this little brief conversation where Obi-Wan Kenobi is like, oh my god, Anakin, I'm sorry. Like, I didn't realize, you know, all the stuff that I did to you was all my fault. And then Anakin responds back to him saying, like, you didn't kill Anakin Skywalker, I did. You know, at least in some way like that, not verbatim. Um, it was a good exchange of dialogue. And then finally, uh, he goes, my friend is truly dead. Or, yeah, like, my friend is actually dead. And instead of just, like, killing him right there, okay, 
he actually calls him Darth and walks away. I thought that when he finally called him Darth, that was a clear nod to episode four because that's what he calls Darth Vader when you first see them. This was when they were making that movie. They didn't know that Darth Vader was going to be Anakin Skywalker and he just called him Darth like if it was his actual first name. But he didn't even call him Vader. He just, it was almost kind of like said like an insult and I liked that. It made sense for that exchange. Now, Vader is there. He's screaming. He wants him to continue. He wants to continue fighting or finish him off. He doesn't do it. Vader, clearly, Obi-Wan Kenobi is the master where it's like, Anakin has looked so pathetic in that moment where he's so defeated and he's still willing to fight, but he's so messed up that Darth Vader's like, no, nah, I can't do this. I mean, uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi's like, no, nah, I can't do this. I don't want to do this. And he just walks off and he immediately gets on his shuttle and starts flying away thinking that I guess he's going to go to the resistance cell or to the little path cell. And he senses Luke in danger. Okay, when, when the hell was that? Like for like the majority of the show, he should have been checking in on Luke with the force. You know what I'm saying? Like he should have at least been checking in on him, like force, like, you know, sensing if Luke is okay or Owen, like we should have gotten at least cutbacks every once in a while. But he does that and he realizes that Reva's over there. Again, this weird jumping and weird use of time passage. Okay, he senses that. He immediately goes into light speed in the shuttle. I didn't know that this shuttle had light speed capabilities. I didn't know it had a hyperdrive, <laughs> right? But again, I, I, we're, we're going full speed ahead at this point, right? He goes over there. He arrives on uh, Tatooine and eventually he arrives there mad quick, okay? Arrives there mad quick. He sees Uncle Owen and Aunt Beru like frantically trying to search for Luke because they're shouting out for him. Instead of looking around since this girl, Reva, is chasing this kid, instead of like scrambling around, they're just like still on the farm screaming out for him. And Obi-Wan arrives in the shuttle. He's like, where the heck is the kid? Uh, they're like, we're trying to find him and stuff. So he eventually goes off uh, a little bit further. Okay, now before all this happens, because I did jump away from this, we get a moment where Reva is chasing Luke in the Beggar's Canyon. It looks it looks like Beggar's Canyon, right? Where where in episode four, the Sand People and Luke Skywalker had their exchange. So Luke is like trying to sneak away, and Reva's like in pursuit of him. Reva uses the Force to trip Luke Skywalker. Okay, obviously Luke doesn't know what the Force is at this point, but she uses the Force to kind of like trip him. And uh, he slips on some rocks and slips down the cliff and he falls down and he's clearly knocked out, okay? Thank God he's knocked out because Reva then pulls out her Inquisitor lightsaber and gets ready to slash at him. And it looks like she's going to chop him up right then and there because he's just unconscious on the ground. But when you cut back and finally get back to this point when Obi-Wan arrives, she's carrying Luke and brings him back to the Lars farm and puts him on the ground. Now, it, they try to play it off like he's dead. But he's actually not. He starts moving again. And Uncle Owen and Aunt Beru take him there. And Reva and Obi-Wan have a moment. It comes to the point where Reva's like, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do all this stuff. They really try hard to make her redeemable. We all saw this coming from a mile away. And to be honest with you, like straight up, and I know people aren't going to like to hear this, it does not feel like it is earned genuinely. It feels obnoxious. Again, that the character, a lot of the different story points with Reva just feels obnoxious all over the place. She does horrible things in this show. And I get it. Like, you could still do horrible things in the Star Wars universe and be redeemed. But, like, the way that she goes about it, she's more, like, vicious and more, like, gung-ho than the rest of the Inquisitors. Which, by the way... Let's freaking talk about the Inquisitors. The fifth brother, the Grand Inquisitor, the others, the, was it? I think it's the, the, the third, not the third sister, because um, that's Reva. Uh, the fourth or the sixth sister. The other Inquisitor are there. They disappear. They're gone. <laughs> they are nowhere to be found in this episode. Why? I have no idea. It looks like either the team forgot about them or they decided to write them off. They didn't even, I don't even think they dropped the line of saying where they went to go in pursuit of the other people. The other, uh, what is it, the path cell or the different resistance people there. That's just weird to me because you would think, right? You would think that at some point they would probably cut back and show either Roken trying to escape the other Inquisitors and maybe they get away from them or something. But like after they were in this show for so long, you know, quote unquote, so, so long, like possibly not really doing much, you would think that they would still show up in the finale. And it was like, you know, everybody else, you didn't realize it until after you saw the episode. That's how bad it was. And it's like, damn, man. Like, after they're so important to Star Wars canon, like, you would think they get a little bit more shine here. But, once again, I digress. So, Reva and Obi-Wan have this conversation. And I, I just, again, I just don't feel like it's as uh, genuinely earned as it probably should be. 
You know, if it was more that we saw Reva that wasn't as vicious and maybe she was hesitant to do some of the stuff that she does in this show and instead giving those to like the fifth brother or the Grand Inquisitor or something, I would be more down with this. I would be more in line with liking Reva as a character in general than what we got with this show overall. But she's pretty much crying. She couldn't do it. It reminded her of what Anakin did at the temple to the younglings, which again, I, I understand the parallel parallel that they were trying to build here, but it just does not come off right. It could have been handled in so many more better ways that I think would have come off much better in translation on the series than, than anything else what they did here. But Obi-Wan now lets her go. Like she's free. She throws down her... Uh, Inquisitor lightsaber he says that you're free now and I'm free too which is a weird line and I understand what he was trying to make the point with but still like now she's roaming around she's clearly getting her spin-off series the rumors about that is probably 100% true just like the leaks of this show leading up to this point all of it has been 100% true at this point which is Again, it feels a little weird to say that and almost a little bit disappointing because it's like this was telegraphed from a mile away if you read the leaks. But anyway, we finally get back to Vader, who's back in his castle. Okay, so time again has passed. You know, there's been a passage of time that we don't know how long it's passed, right? But he's back in his castle and he's talking to Emperor Palpatine. Now, this was cool because Ian McDermott it didn't kind of like leak out or didn't like you know spoil the surprise that he was in the obi-wan show he kind of played it off like he wasn't but it makes sense and it was cool to see him talking to vader via hologram because the emperor is doing things during this time frame and i'm pretty sure vader would be checking in with the emperor as he's trying to pursue obi-wan kenobi they have an exchange basically saying that obi-wan is like you know they're gonna put out probe droids or whatever comb the area and like he won't escape him anymore and the Emperor makes the point, is like, listen, you know, is are you blinded by your rage? Are you blinded by your hate? Uh, if you can't overcome your past. And then Vader checks himself and he's like, listen, I only live to serve you. And finally, they use the Imperial March theme. It's like, oh my God, why did it take six episodes of this series to finally start using that John Williams music? I'm just saying the music should have been used throughout the series along with the new music. It's like, what the heck, man? But it's cool to see that. Vader sitting on his throne. He looks awesome. Ian McDermott looks cool. He looks a little older, but I think like it makes sense, you know, with the way that they render him out. He looks pretty good for the Emperor, even in a hologram form, right? So finally, we go back to Alderaan. We see Leia. We see, uh, was it Bail Organa? We see his wife. We see everybody there. Obi-Wan visits Alderaan, okay? They have a conversation there. Leia is kind of getting back into her role, like foreshadowing what she's going to become eventually in the original Star Wars trilogy. Uh, Obi-Wan and uh, Leia have an exchange there after he arrives, which, again, going right up to the line of canon, because technically the way that they explain a lot of this off was that Obi-Wan tells her that she needs to be careful knowing him because it could endanger her life. And I could buy that explanation. I think maybe things could have been handled a little bit differently, possibly, and not even have this exchange because really Obi-Wan should have much more of a connection with Luke Skywalker. And they played it off in this series like he doesn't really know or care about Luke up to the point of the very end. But we'll get to that in a second. But he explains to her, like, listen, like, if anybody knew that, like, it put us in grave danger. So he explains that off. And guess what they do finally here? He tells her, may the force be with you. And they use the force theme finally. It's like, oh my God. Like now we're just going to get a John Williams music dump, you know, because they're trying to line up with episode four. It's like, I love hearing the theme. It sounds great. It's a heartwarming moment. But this music should have been alluded to throughout the series. It's like, come on, man. It's just weird. Like I'm not upset that they used it. Okay, thank God they finally used it. But it's just, they're using it now instead of using it throughout the series since this time frame would have made sense for that on top of the new theme that Obi-Wan Kenobi has. Anyway, we finally go back to Tatooine. We got Uncle O in there. He's doing things. Luke Skywalker there is tinkering around with probably some uh, power converter stuff. Who knows? If that's a power converter, that would actually be pretty funny. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Or at least parts of a power converter. I would have been totally cool with that. But uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi, he, he gathers all the things from his cave. And I thought originally that he was just going to gather everything up and maybe go find his hut that Ben Kenobi has in the original trilogy. But he just picks up all his stuff and he goes on his Yopi. He goes over to the Lars farm. Uh, and yeah, he starts talking to Owen for a bit. Owen says like, look, I thought you were going to stay away. And Obi-Wan's like, yeah, I'll stay away. But you know, just want to check in and just make sure that you got this right. And, uh, Uncle Owen under his breath as Obi-Wan is like tinkering around with some stuff. He's like, yeah, I got this. And then he tells him, hey, do you want to meet him? So it implies up to this point, uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi has never really spoken to Luke Skywalker, like at all, which I guess you could say they kind of showed that earlier, even in the first or second episode of the show. 
but it's like, damn, man, like he never even like, you know, spoke to him like that once throughout all these 10 years since Revenge of the Sith when he was growing up. Like this is the first time he's really meeting Luke like that. I don't know. Again, it, it just feels a little weird, but he finally says, yeah. So he goes up to Luke. Luke doesn't really say anything. Like he doesn't really have a lot of dialogue, even in this episode, even when he's being chased by Reva. But he goes up to him, has the little T-16 Skyhopper toy with him. And he goes, hello there. Which he was like, everybody in, that was watching in the watch party was like, huh? he said it, he said it, finally. But it was like, I would have loved to have like a short convo between the two. He's like, I would have loved if the kid had said that my name is Luke Skywalker. Like, why couldn't he have not said that? Like, you know, it's just little things like this. I feel like would have made sense to have in there, would have been even more heartwarming. But here's the big stinger for the end of the episode. And we're coming to this at the end of it. As you guys could tell, I've had a lot to say about this season finale, right? So finally... We see Obi-Wan Kenobi, he's riding in his Eopi. It's getting very Western out here. And as he's riding around, just chill with his Eopi in the middle of the desert, we finally get to see a Force Ghost apparition of Qui-Gon Jinn. Now, in the watch party, we saw people crying, <laughs> poking fun a little bit at Star Wars Theory because Homeboy was crying as soon as he saw Qui-Gon. He flipped out. Everybody was excited. It was very short-lived, right up to the end of the episode, but it was nice to see Liam Neeson actually show up as Qui-Gon Jinn. He's been very coy about it, and we all knew it was like, at some point, my man's going to show up. But it was good to finally see him. He was like, yeah, um, what is it? It was good to, to was it? I was always there with you, Obi-Wan. You know, it was about time that you're finally able to see me, uh, come with me, we got a lot of stuff to do. So basically, Obi-Wan is going to go into the desert, he's probably going to go find his hut, and he's going to continue his training with Qui-Gon Jinn and actually have a conversation. I would have loved, throughout this show, at some point sooner, if he would have talked to Qui-Gon Jinn instead of ending on it. Because as much as I love this moment, as much as it's cool, it makes me wish to see more of what's going on with Obi-Wan with Qui-Gon there. Because I feel like certain aspects of the show would have been better. Granted, this wasn't the story that they were telling. I get it. I totally understand. I'm being a little nitpicky. I'm not trying to be ungrateful. But I'm just saying, like everybody else that was watching this alongside of me, we were all thinking the exact same thing. But anyway, that's where the episode ends. There's no after credits, which Star Wars doesn't really do an after credits. You know, they've done it maybe like sparingly with the Mandalorian and Book of Boba Fett, but they didn't do it here for Obi-Wan Kenobi. I would have been very surprised if they did so, maybe teasing Reva, because once Reva leaves at that point, after speaking to Obi-Wan, you don't see her again. Again, you don't see her, you don't see the Inquisitors, you don't see Roken, you don't see the Resistance Cell, none of that. You don't get to see much of anything, really, besides, you know, Obi-Wan, besides Vader, Palpatine, Uncle Owen, uh, Amparu, I don't even think you see Amparu at the very end. You only see Uncle Owen and Luke Skywalker. You know, it would have been nice maybe just hearing her like talk to Luke or scream out to Luke something, you know, just to wrap it all up nicely. But again, those are nitpicks. So overall, to wrap up this podcast episode, because I know I'm going longer than usual, was episode six of Obi-Wan Kenobi much better or the best episode or was it good overall? I say that it has good moments. There is a lot of things, as you could tell from this whole conversation I'm having with you, that I really do not like or have little issues with. That could have been better, that should have been better, because this was the ultimate final episode, the finale of this show. Uh, I think that at some point, a lot of people were saying recently that this might get a season two. I don't know if I really want a season two, to be honest with you. Even though I would love to see more what's going on with Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon, I don't know what other story you tell. I don't know what other things you go from here. Like, you could do your spinoff episode with Reva, or spinoff show with Reva, but do I even really want to see that show with that character, despite all my problems with what I felt like with her character in this show? Like, it's just weird things like that. The fights, or at least the fight, the big fight here was great. I thought that, you know, despite my little criticisms of it, it was still fun to see. It had some cool moments. The cameos were nice. I wish that they were a little bit longer than what we initially saw here. Uh, but as far as the show itself, as far as the episode itself... This was better than the worst episodes. I'll tell you that. I still think that the best episode, in my opinion, is either episode three or episode five, personally. Uh, granted, the stingers are very hard to compete with here because, again, we're getting Qui-Gon, we're getting Palpatine, we're seeing all that stuff, we're getting John Williams music, so it's a little hard for those episodes to compare. But as far as like the rest of the episodes, it was much better than episode four. Uh, clearly it was shot and filmed better. I still think it's weird having the shaky cam because even when you're looking at Darth Vader in the time when he's talking to Emperor Palpatine on the hologram, the camera's like moving a little bit. Like it's like shaking. It's like, why does that need to happen? What is with shaky cam in this show? 
What is with shaky cam and all the Disney show, Plus shows, to be honest with you? But it just felt like little things like that should be just, you know, addressed or fixed. Like, I, I don't know. I don't know how you deal with it. But, you know, overall, it still wasn't a terrible episode. It still was a much better episode than the worst ones we've seen of this show. Probably not the best, but it was still a good way to kind of like end the show on. So there you guys go. Those are my thoughts about the season finale, episode six of Obi-Wan Kenobi. Let me know your own thoughts about this show or this episode down in the comments below. This episode, or at least this podcast, is going to go up early for Patreon supporters. So if you're listening to it now, thank you for supporting my Patreon. I'm going to give it like a day or two to simmer on it uh, before it goes live for everybody else on, uh, what is it, on YouTube. Uh, But yeah, man, like I've enjoyed at least watching the show with everybody and talking about it. Granted, my criticisms and everything else aside, it's still been fun to follow the show with everybody, you know, throughout each uh, each week with each new episode. So anyway, I'm going to get ready to go talk about some other stuff very soon. I'll probably put a non-spoiler review on TikTok for everybody and uh, get ready to start playing some more games because there's more games to get through very, very soon. Oh, by the way, if you haven't already, definitely check out my video about Knights of the Old Republic 2 for Nintendo Switch that I put up on the channel recently because the game is broken. Aspire is trying to fix it and I can't complete it, so I'm not going to do a full review of the game until Aspire fixes up the game and patches it and stuff. But anyway, talk to you guys again very soon. Peace out and stay epic, everybody.